And those who want the world to become smaller, they don't care two peanuts for your life. <laughs> they don't care two peanuts so the billions will die. No, they don't care for you. How to get the world smaller? Much smaller. You need to get billions of people to die. How to get it? Smaller. This is my view. You don't have to accept my view. So don't come after me after the lecture. If you defer with me, I am okay with that. But then you will tell me how is the world going to become smaller? One way, of course, is warfare. And that is weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear warfare. And the other way, the safer way, the easier way, the way which leaves no nasty footprints, <laughs> is biological warfare. Okay, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, so all here, Milford, uh, East London, those watching on Zoom, uh, and those watching later on YouTube, inshallah. We are very honored today to be in the presence of such a highly educated and esteemed scholar and philosopher. The Sheikh has authored numerous books which are on sale here today. All of the books written are on very important but overlooked topics, such as Riba, Jerusalem in the Quran, the Jal and the Joseph, Constantinople, recitation according to the moon, studying according to the stars, as well as understanding the great war ahead, Gog and Magog, the beginning and the end of history. Never forgetting to credit his teachers, especially Maulana Muhammad Fazlur Rahman, I'm sorry, Allah have mercy on his soul. Sheikh Irman Hussein has been a shining light in dark times for hundreds of thousands and maybe even millions of Muslims around the world. For decades, the Sheikh has blessed us with his insight by combining his geopolitical and socio-economical knowledge with Islamic eschatology, in which the Sheikh is responsible for pioneering and still appears to courageously stand alone in accurately explaining the world that we live in today. This appears to be of utmost importance as it enables the Muslims around the world to snap ourselves out of our sleep and out of our own ignorance, and instead to think critically in order to preserve our Iman, especially at the time of our death. And on this note, speaking about our death, there could not be a more befitting topic for the Sheikh to speak on today, as many of us are well aware of the confusing and deceptive times we live in. We pray that we all maximize the time we have left with the Sheikh before he flies back to his home in Trinidad and Tobago. Please keep the questions short, concise, and relevant to the topic of today's talk. Without any further ado, Sheikh Amman Hussain, Biological Warfare in Akhir Saman. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all His noble messengers. And in particular, on the last of them all, the Blessed Prophet Muhammad as we greet you from Masjid Nurul Islam in Infant, in London, in Britain. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to begin by thanking Masjid Nurul Islam for their invitation for me to lecture in a masjid in Britain. Uh, this is a good sign. And uh, that we should be talking to you today on this critically important subject of biological warfare in Akhir Zaman. Akhir Zaman means the end of time in time. It is a monstrously evil subject. 
and it is the terrifying subject. And so we have to begin with a word of comfort for what is to come afterwards. And that is it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us words of comfort in the Quran. And he says, listen carefully. It is in Surah Al-Isra. He says, وَإِذَا كَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ And when you recite the Qur'an, and of course, we recite with the tongue. We read with the eyes, but we recite with the tongue. وَإِذَا كَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ And when you recite the Qur'an, جَعَلْنَا بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ إِجَابًا مَسْتُورًا we place between you and that godless world in Akira is a man which does not believe in a life hereafter. This is the only world for them. This dunya. They live for this dunya. They die for this dunya. <clears throat> but you and I believe in a life hereafter. So Allah places a hijab between us and then, and that hijab covers, separates, and protects. But provided that you recite the Quran the way that Allah recited it, did Allah recite the Quran? Did you ever hear that before? No, you never heard it before. But Allah recited the Quran. And then he said to Nabi Muhammad, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, he said, When I have recited the Quran, you must follow that way of recitation. Have you ever heard that? Never? When I have recited the Quran, you, O oh Muhammad, Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. You must recite the Quran that way. Did you ever hear that? Kabi Sunabdin? Well, I have a surprise for you. <laughs> this is in the Quran. This is in the Quran. Inna alayna Jama'ahu wa Qur'an. O Muhammad, alayhi salatu wa sallam, you recite, you are receiving these revelations and you don't know where it's going. So I am telling you, O Muhammad, alayhi salatu wa sallam, I will bring all the revelations together. Jama'ahu, bring it together as a whole. And when I have done that, I will recite the Quran. For Quran. Now listen to the next verse. This is Surah Al Qiyamah. You don't believe me? Go check it. <laughs> check it out. Faiza karatnahu. This is in the plural. First person plural. And when we have recited, I use the singular. And when I have recited, you must follow that way of recitation. First time you heard it. And this is in the Quran. After, after we have taught you how to recite the Quran. Then we'll teach you the Quran, the meaning of the Quran. So you can't study the Quran unless you are first reciting the Quran. I wish I had the time today. 
to teach you how to recite the Quran because nobody is doing that the correct way. But I have a book entitled The Quran and the Moon, Quran or Chan. We don't have it in Britain as yet. It's available in Pakistan, in Urdu and in English. But you can get it from my website. You can download it free of charge and read that book. You have to recite the whole Quran. How old are you? Ten. That's best age. Ten. By the age of ten, your children must be reciting the whole Quran. From cover to cover. This is called khatam. Khatam means to complete the recitation of the Quran. Every month. Not January, February. The lunar month. And therefore you have to recite the first juz, juz, the first part or sipara on the first day. And the second on the second day and the third on the third day. But Allah has prohibited you from chopping the Quran, from cutting the Quran in pieces. Then, no, 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 the first Jews is until 141 in Al Baqarah. Chop! You do that? He says in Surah Al Hijr. For Rabbika, O Muhammad, alayhi salatu waslam, I take an oath by your Rabb. Lanas'alannahum ajma'in amma kanu amaloon. I'm going to question every single one of them for what they have done to this Quran. He has divided the Quran into surah. And you come to chop the Quran? What is your fate on judgment day? So the first Jews, of course, every Jews must begin with al fatiha Chavi, as you said, and the first Jews, therefore, is al fatiha and the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah. The second Jews is Surah Al-Fatiha and the whole of Surah Ali That is the way you have to recite the Quran. So get the Azhar from my book and read. Recite the Quran that way. And if you recite the Quran the way that Allah recited it, then there was a comfort for you to give you some hope in these hopeless times that this Quran can protect you in this age of biological warfare. And this Quran, uh, come forward, come forward, come forward. Come on, fill up the space here, fill up the space. Come, come, fill up the space here. <laughs> this Quran can protect you in this age of biological warfare. Now, then, with these words of comfort, we can now turn to this monstrously evil and this terrifying subject of biological warfare in our period. Don't leave this masjid in a state of hopelessness. No. You still have the Quran and the Quran can protect you and protect your children and your family. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu islam prophesied about Akhir was the man. I said in Akhir was the man, there'd be great liars. So beware. People who tell lies present to you an external form which differs from the internal substance. So you are deceived when you tell lies. He said that the Jal will come with two things, a river and the fire. But his river, which looks like the cool waters of a river, is actually a fire. And his fire 
Everyone is running away from it. That's the cold waters of the river. And so things are not going to be what they appear to be. You have to penetrate, tell your medical doctors that medical science is in, inadequate to deal with biological warfare. Scientific scholarship is inadequate to deal with the subject because appearance and reality are different from each other. How do you deal with a world in which things are not what they appear to be? The answer, and I have not come with boxing gloves against the Darul Hum, I'm just trying to wake them up. If they will listen to me, it will be beneficial for them. The answer is conventional scholarship cannot penetrate beyond appearance to reach reality. The answer is conventional scholarship cannot penetrate beyond appearance to reach the internal reality of a subject. Well, then what kind of scholarship do we need in Akhiru Zaman? And the answer is there in Surah al -Kep. If you want to study and understand biological warfare in Akhiru Zaman, forget it, you can't do it with conventional scholarship. And Surah al -Kep, Surah al -Kep of the Quran, in one of the most Beautiful passages of the whole Quran explained in Akhir was the man. The encounter of Musa alayhi salam with Khidr alayhi salam. I just taught this subject in Ardenia. The encounter of Musa alayhi salam who is used in this subject to, to represent conventional scholarship. What's the color of the cow? What's the size of the cow? What kind of cow is it? <laughs> conventional scholarship. And in this encounter between Musa -Salam, and Khidr -Salam, Khidr got his name his nickname, Green, Mr. Green, <laughs> because his scholarship is not conventional scholarship. His scholarship is like raindrops falling from the sky, a fresh breeze, which brings the dead heart back to life, but everything becomes green where formerly it was barren. This scholarship can take a people by storm and transform an entire people, this scholarship. Conventional scholarship can't do it. And three things occur when Musa Islam follows him. Number one, the boat. I'm not seeing you shaking your head. The boat. Yes. yes. Right. Number two, the boy. Number three, the wall. On all three occasions, conventional scholarship came to one conclusion. But the scholarship of Khidr, which is the scholarship of the, of Akhiru Zaman, and this is the message I'm trying to convey to the Darulum, and they wouldn't listen to me. They shut their doors on me, but they will regret one day. They will regret one day. They will regret one day. The scholarship of Khidr alayhi salam, this is the scholarship that you need for Akhidu Zaman. That conventional scholarship cannot work in Akhidu Zaman. And Khidr is able to penetrate the subject, the boat, the boy, and the wall. But when he explains 
all three. It is not a tafsir. Rather, it is a ta'wil. He is explaining, but he is interpreting in order to explain. Ta'wil. And interpretation does not function only on the basis of the rational faculty, the capacity to think. Interpretation requires something else. It requires much al Bahrain. That the two oceans must meet. The ocean of knowledge externally acquired and the ocean of knowledge internally received. And you cannot get it internally unless you have noor in your heart, and they don't sell noor in the supermarket. <clears throat> and you're not going to get noor if you arrogantly, arrogantly, arrogantly stand up in the way of someone who is explaining the truth to you. Your arrogance will one day be a rope around your neck. And so, unless the heart is clean and pure. And you know what are the things which destroy your heart. In this way, number one is zina. Number two is zina, number three is zina. <laughs> and then we could turn to the rest. Uh, watch it, watch it, watch it. Because zina, which is fornication and adultery, and all your noodle will disappear. And you will be left with only darkness. Right? And the next thing that destroys no is oppression. Then you employ someone and you pay them the wage of a slave. I just came back from Pakistan. And I found that in 75 years, the economy of Pakistan has remained the same. It's a, an economy of slave masters and slaves. And if you oppress anyone, <clears throat> there's no door in your heart. So then, if you are to study the subject of biological warfare in Akhiruza, you need a different kind of scholarship from conventional scholarship. You need to be able to penetrate beyond external appearances to reach reality. And beware, because he said, in Akhiruza, there are great liars. That's why I said, you know, there are normal lies and then there are great lies and then there is 9 11. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been saying this for 20 years and not from today. 20 years now. And uh, I've survived a long time. The Nabi Muhammad also said about. Yeah, and Jews and man Jews, God and Magar. Then they're going to corrupt the whole world. We know from Surah al kaf that they have an indestructible power. <coughs> Only Allah can destroy. And number two, that no power in the world can stand up to them. Quarks will turn in, he tell you. And we know from Surah to Lambia that when they are released into the world, the world will experience for the first time and for the last time and for the only time. Let me repeat that. The world will experience for the first time, for the last time, and for the only time. An amazing phenomenon. And if you miss that, then you truly, truly are sleeping. That the people who never appeared on the stage of history will suddenly come on the stage of history. And with indestructible power, they spread out all over the world. But they use their power to oppress, and they use their power to corrupt. Everything they touch, they corrupt. 
And for the first time, the only time and the last time, a people will spread out and take control of the world. And when they do that, they will then use that control over the world to bring a people back to a town which Allah had destroyed. And the people had been expelled from that town and had been banned from ever returning to reclaim that town with their own. Until this unique phenomenon occurs that they spread out all over the world and they take control of power all over the world. They will bring these people back to the town to reclaim it as their own. It happens only once in history. And if you can't see that, you're blind. <laughs> or you are stuck in some piece of concrete with a solitary hadith that you don't understand and you misinterpret. And you're betraying the Quran and disrespecting the Quran. But there are people, no matter how many times I teach the subject, they never listen to me. So let's wait. On Judgment Day, we'll see who is correct and who is wrong, who is misguided and who is rightly guided. Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, but in Pakistan they call him Allah Iqbal. But I say great men don't need any titles. <laughs> Dr. Muhammad Iqbal, about a hundred years ago, he wrote in poetry, Khul gaye ya juj or ma juj, Khul gaye ya juj or ma juj ke lashkar tamam, all all the forces of Gog and Magog have been released. And this is one of the most prominent scholars of Islam for the modern age. Another man to be trifled with. Cheshwe Muslim Dekhle Tafsir Harfi Yansirun. Iqbal is saying, go back to the Quran and go back to that passage in Surah Al Anbiya, which ends with the word. Which town is it? Our Prophet said <laughs> that Gog and Magog would be destroyed by Allah in Jerusalem. The town in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is destroyed and the Jews and the Christians, the Israelites were expelled. A ban was placed on them. They could never return to reclaim Jerusalem as their own. Until when? Until Gog and Magog are released. And then with their indestructible power, they take control of power all over the world. The, the wars of colonialism and imperialism. British ruling over India. Where were you sleeping all the time? Or eating biryani? And then the, the Gog and Magog will bring the Jews back to Jerusalem. Has it happened? Yes. Huh? Has it happened? Yes. Kul gayeya Jews or ma Jews ke lashkar tamam. And so Gog and Magog today control the world. They control power in the world. And very bloody for those who have a little bit of capacity to think. It is modern Western civilization which, with indestructible power, was released into the world and the armies swept the world and they took control of power all over the world. Whoever stood in their way, they brutalized them. And it is the modern West which brought the Jews back to Jerusalem to reclaim it as their own. And so if you have five pounds worth, Pakistan, I'd say five rupees worth of intelligence, you know. Forget them who refuse to think. History will leave them where they are. Oh. But you can think. Gog and Magog are those who control power 
in modern Western civilization. When these words, they'll close the masjid for me. They'll shut the doors of the masjid for me for preaching the truth. Wait, we'll see what's going to be the end of this story. And so if you want to study biological warfare, you need not only to penetrate beyond the experience, experience, the experience to the reality, but you have to recognize who are the authors of this monstrously evil kind of war. Biological warfare. One more thing, and that is that Surah Al Mursalat of the Quran tells us of a shadow. <coughs> For those who have been rejecting the signs of Allah, the truth which has come from Allah. So Allah is sending a shadow upon the world. In Taliku, Irazil in Zi Sala Sishra, there are no shadows in Jannah. Shadows belong to this world. Shadows belong to the material universe. In Taliku, Irazil in Zi Sala Sishra. Proceed now, let history proceed to a shadow which will come upon the world and we should have three parts. Three parts of a shadow. And when the three parts are over, the shadow will be gone and then you see the reality itself. My eschatology tells me that's the job. But I don't want you to accept my views until you have done some thinking of your own. And you have come to the conclusion that I have come to. Otherwise, such students are a danger to me to simply accept everything. You are a danger. I want you to think. And in the Hadith of Tabim al-Dari, our Prophet said the same thing. Alayhi salatu wa salam. And when the Jal is released, he he will live for 40 days on earth, 40, not mathematical, 40. One day like a year, first part. One day like a month, second part. One day like a week, third part. And then this shadow disappears. And his day is like our day, he will be in our world of space and time. But only after the three parts of the shadow will be finished. Because I am a scholar of international relations, which I studied in two universities, and I know that the child wants to rule the world from Jerusalem because he wants to impersonate the true Messiah. And our prophet said that the true Messiah, when he returns, we will rule the world. A hakimun adil, a just ruler. So if the Jal is to rule the world eventually, it means that he must have political control over the world. That he must have economic control over the world. And economic control requires also monetary control over the world. And then he must also have military control over the world. This is, this is international relations. So I came to the conclusion 25 years ago, when I was still in New York, that Britain did not emerge as the ruling state in the world by accident. The Pax Britannica and Britain's obsession with Jerusalem and with the Holy Land. Implied. The Pax Britannica is located in the first part 
of the shadow. And I wrote that in my book, Jerusalem in the Quran. We have very few copies now left in Britain. I don't know how many we have there in the back. Pax Britannica is the first part of the shadow. And I wrote Jerusalem in the Quran 20 years ago. And then I noticed that the United States of America replaced Britain as the ruling state in the world. And I said, they didn't have my accident. The United States didn't simply fall out of the sky. But rather, this is the transition from part one to part two. And so Pax Americana is the second stage of the shadow. But America is big. And America is surrounded by water and by Canada at the top. And Mexico at the bottom, but they can know how to handle Mexico. So they're safe. They're safe. You can't attack the United States. Who, who has attacked the United States in 200 years? And Britain is surrounded by water. And before the age of the aircraft, the only way you could attack Britain is if you had a very powerful navy. And Pax Britannica was unique in that Britain had the most powerful naval force in the world and no combination of rivals could challenge it. That's why one of the reasons for the First World War was to tell Germany, you cannot challenge our dominance as a naval power. But... <laughs> Biological warfare now becomes important in Akhir Zaman. And why? Do I need to continue the lecture? The intelligent people already know where the lecture is going. <laughs> you already know. And then the third stage of the shadow will witness a transition from Pax Americana the facts today. This was written 20 years ago in Jerusalem in the past. 20 years ago. But while Britain was immune, so long as you didn't have aircraft, and the United States was immune from warfare, you can't attack the United States. It's so big. They're surrounded by water. They have Canada at the front, and they can handle Mexico. Something called the Monroe Doctrine. We will not allow any government, <clears throat> any state to intervene in Latin America, which threatens our interests. The Monroe Doctrine. But when you have the passage to Pax Judaica, Something different is coming up, completely different. Israel is very small, and Israel is surrounded all around by those who hate and despise it. And the prophecies which have come from the prophets <coughs> are that Israel is going one day to perish. <coughs> So how can Israel survive? There are two possibilities. The first is that Israel must expand and become as big as the United States. Or the other is that the world must become much, much smaller. Which one would it be? Which one would it be? Is Israel going to expand and become the biggest United States? Or is the world going to shrink and become much smaller? The answer is 
This is my view. You don't have to accept my view at all. My view is that the world is going to become much, much smaller. So it becomes manageable for Israel. And those who want the world to become smaller, they don't care two peanuts for your life. <laughs> <laughs> they don't get two peanuts so that billions will die. No, they don't care for you. How to get the world smaller? Much smaller. You need to get billions of people to die. How to get it smaller? This is my view. You don't have to accept my view. So don't come after me after the lecture. If you defer with me, I am okay with that. But then you will tell me how is the world going to become smaller? One way versus warfare. And that is weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear warfare. And the other way the safer way, the easier way, the way which leaves no nasty footprints <laughs> is biological warfare. And so I introduced the subject of biological warfare in Akhirul Zaman in the context of a Pax Judaica which wishes to replace Pax Americana. And the predicament of an Israel which is small and surrounded at all sides by those who hate that country. Is this the biological warfare which will reduce the world's population substantially? Is this it? Only, only some people can answer that, not me. Not you. We are now facing a, for the last almost two years in the world. And while I was in Pakistan, I lectured on this subject several times and I argued. I don't know whether your Darul has made an effort to, but I did it. I said that we who follow the religious way of life, we believe in the God, Allah Ta'ala, the one God. And we believe that he has created all of creation. And he has not created this world with falsehood. Rather, he's created it with truth. And so beneath material reality, there is a spiritual reality that we, ex that we accept, we believe in. And we believe when the Quran says, what najmu wa shajaru yastuda. That the stars and the trees make sense that. Because we believe in the truth which has come from Allah. In Dr. Iqbal's inimitable language, I can't master, I can't ever reach his classical language. He used he used the English language so beautifully. Can you imagine what he's done in Urdu? Mm -hmm. The one who can see with the nur of Allah, it's very rare to find such a man. And he didn't see with the nur. In his mind, he made some mistakes. He said, we believe in a spiritual, a spiritual interpretation of the universe. I don't think modern Western religion could even understand what he said. 
we believe in a spiritual interpretation of the universe. And so nature is alive. And nature is pregnant with truth. And so those who have a capacity to see what others cannot see, we say that nature will not attack mankind, target all of mankind at the same time. That's not possible. That's only from a nature which is built on falsehood and evil. Nature will not target all of mankind with a, at the same time. But those who have given us this have done that. And in the process, they have revealed themselves. By targeting all of mankind at the same time with the they have exposed themselves. That this does not come from nature. And therefore, it constitutes biological warfare. Those who differ with me, we wait on judgment day to see who is right, me or you. Yes, we wait for that. If this represents biological warfare, which no doctor has the competence to speak about, no scientist has the competence to deal with this subject. You need the scholarship of Khidr alayhi salam to deal with this subject. I began the lecture that way. If this represents biological warfare, is it possible that the is innocent? <laughs> no. Those who still have the capacity to think would know that no, the will also be a part of the biological war. In fact, it might be far, far more dangerous than the And so I have made it known that I am not going to take. And if tomorrow I'm not allowed to travel anymore, well then stop traveling. But the reason why I can say I'm not taking them, inshallah, is because I don't have a mortgage on a house. Dependent on my salary every month to pay the mortgage. And if I lose my job, my family will be on the street. I did not trade my freedom for a mortgage. Those of you who have traded your freedom for the American or the British dream of a house that you buy on mortgage, you regret having lost your freedom. You regret having lost your freedom because you are stuck now. You have to remain in your job to pay the mortgage. And the only way you can remain in your job is by taking the So don't ask me, Sheikh, what to do. <laughs> don't waste your time sending an email, Sheikh, what to do. Give me some guidance. And then there are those who have children. And your children will not be allowed to go to school until they are So what am I going to do? If I keep my children at home, they might even come and see my children. And then there are those who say, no, we're leaving. How are we leaving? We're not going to remain here. Your wife says to you, honey, you can go, I'm staying. <laughs> <laughs> and children, if children say to you, Papa, you can go, we stay. <laughs> You're stuck. How can I leave my wife and children? 
That's the road to freedom. I can't mean it. Don't blame me, blame yourself. <laughs> if you accept this analysis, then you'll not be a part of the, my language is going to be harsh now, the sheep and the cattle who betrayed the religion in the masjid. The sheep and the cattle who disgracefully betrayed Islam in the masjid. <coughs> When Allah's messenger said, if you leave a space, shaitan will come and take that space. And you say, no, the government said we have to leave this space. Tell Muhammad Islam, stay out of the masjid. The government is in charge here, not Muhammad Islam. And like sheep and like cattle all over Britain, they stood three feet apart. On judgment day, you know. Who it is who wanted you to do that and who is laughing at you now? You committed bidah. So, no water for you from Kausal on that day. One hadith says it is the Prophet who will not give you water. And the Prophet say No water for you because you changed the religion. But the other hadith is Allah who is saying to him, don't give them any water. They change the religion after you left. And the sheep and the cattle will obey the order. You cannot perform salat in the masjid without a What do you do when those who have power in the world give you this ruling? That only five people can assemble for Salat al Jummah. Or eight people can assemble, not more than that. And you must stand three feet apart and you must wear. So what do you do? The answer for those who have a little bit of common sense is it is better to stay home and perform your Salat than to go to the masjid and change the religion. They're going to be angry with me now all over Britain for exposing them. Betrayal! Same people who close the doors of the masjid on me. But alhamdulillah that these words can reach the masses in Britain. And they're listening to me. And those who betrayed the religion are now going to be the laughing stock of the world. So what do we do? Our prophet said, when a plague breaks out, today is called an epidemic. If you are in the area where the epidemic is taking place, don't leave. And if you're outside, don't enter. But he never said, shut down the market. He never said, stop going to the masjid. He never said, don't go and visit your neighbor who is ill. He said, if you stay where you are, not running away, and you die, you're Shaheed. Would you believe it? There are people who say that they are Muslim, that they're running, running away from Shaheed. They don't want to be Shaheed. <laughs> They've been with this for almost two years now. And I'm in a masjid and speaking truthfully to you. I have never known any fear in my heart for even one fraction of a minute for all of these two years. I have lived my life normally these last two years. And I found people with, you know, baby wipe. <laughs> and they're wiping the, the handle of the door. <laughs> and the faucet and they wipe it. Anyway, and the inside of the house. <laughs> Can you imagine the taxation of that heart? Living in constant fear. Our Prophet however, told us that the time will come when a believer in order to preserve his deed, we'll have to flee to the mountainside and place his rain falls. 
taking with him some sheep and goats. Oh, no. You're not going to find any social distancing out there in the remote countryside. And Albania, you've got lovely mountains. Oh, yes. You have lovely, like the north of Pakistan, lovely mountains, Mashallah. You go to the mountainside, the places where rain falls. You withdraw from society. You produce your own food, your own milk and meat. And you, your, your religion will survive. You remain in the city and you're going to lose your religion. But our Prophet also said, one of the signs of the last day is that the Arabs are going to experience plague, which is epidemic. <clears throat> and they will die the way sheep die in a plague. <clears throat> I have a few minutes left before the Azan. And I came to the conclusion more than a year and a half ago when the virus first started. I came to the conclusion that this has come from the child. And this has not occurred accidentally. That there was an enormous amount of planning that took place prior to the emergence of this. And the was meant to proceed stage by stage incrementally until it reaches its conclusion. That conclusion could not only be vast amount of deaths around the world, but more importantly, that the Arab will be wiped out by plague, prophesied by the Prophet And so a it will be uh, DNA specific for the Arabs or if it is meant for them will wipe out the Arabs in Israel and around Israel where they live in densely community, densely populated communities and this of course is meant to facilitate Facts today, you'll have an enormous, a lot of time after Salat al Isha uh, for questions and answers. I have by no means exhausted the subject. I had to spend some time on that very important introduction in order to take you to the subject, which is monstrously evil and terrifying. But I had to give you that message of hope at the beginning. <clears throat> so you would not leave the masjid in terror. And that is that if you recite the Quran the way that Allah recites it, I read my book, the Quran and the moon, forget that way. Then the Quran can protect you. <clears throat> Allah will place a hijab between you. And that God this world. And that hijab will cover you, separate you from them, and protect you. And I had to tell you at the beginning that our prophet says that in Akhiru Zaman there'll be great lion. So don't think things. Don't take things at their face value. That the external form is different from the internal substance. And if you cannot penetrate the internal substance, you'll be misguided by the external form. Those who can penetrate the internal substance are few, but in Mushkil say Hotahechamandi, be our beta. The man who has the capacity to penetrate the internal substances is born very rarely. So you have to search for those who have the profile of Kidder, alayhi salam. I am now 83 years of age by the moon. 
I have to say that because Allah says in the Quran, did you know that? I gave you the moon, I gave you the moon to count the years and to compute time. So 83 years by the moon and almost 80 by the sun. So my time is coming to an end, but the young ones, the young ones have to be brought, educated and taught and brought to life. And from amongst them, we must have the profile of Khidr Salam. And they might be able to teach the Daru which is not willing to listen. Thank <laughs> you.